There's a place I have found in the shade on the ground. Hello and welcome to Vine Permaculture Podcast Episode 5. I'm joined today by Mike Jones. Hi. And Crystal Heyer. Hi. Uh, I'm Cormac. And today we're going to be discussing our lunchtime episode, lunchtime learning episode five, which was about uh, zone one kitchen garden, uh, reading seed packets and journaling, something I don't do, <laughs> which I should. <laughs> uh, so I suppose we'll start off with the the the, the zone zone one kitchen garden, uh, just for to explain anyone who doesn't know what the zones are. So in permaculture, you have zone zero, which is your house, zone one. Which is right outside your your door, and then as you go further up the zones, you get further away, and it's just places you access less. Um, so kitchen gardens, I suppose my whole property is a kitchen garden, really, because it's that small. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so we can chat about that later. But uh, Mike, have you a specific kitchen garden? We do. Yeah. It, was, it was our first garden. We we built this house about uh, six years ago, uh, five, six years ago. And that was the first garden we developed the same even while it was under construction. Uh, we started, did a hugel culture mound and built a box or two. Um, but yeah, it's right outside. Uh, you know, our kitchen actually have to go through the greenhouse first. Then you get to the kitchen garden. So the greenhouses this year for sure is going to be greens. We're going to put greens right in there. So that's actually part of the kitchen. It's a sort of different kind of kitchen garden than your French potager, you know, just because it's a, another layer. And it's also a, a zone eight, and I live in zone 3B. So uh, we have two, wow. kitchen gardens, two kitchen gardens. <laughs> so is that, a, is that a zone uh, zone 0.5 and a zone one? <laughs> in uh, what, the, in the English system? Uh, your, your greenhouse is a 0.5 and then the, the, the kitchen. Yes. Is, 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 is a zone one. Uh, yeah, the, kid, well, the kitchen's like, Zone was it? We keep it at seventy degrees, so I guess our actual kitchen is zone ten or eleven. It's nice, it's indoors, but not a lot of sunlight. Um, but yeah, so we have a two layered kitchen garden, and I, like you were saying about distances, um, you know, your kitchen garden is just right off of the kitchen. The closest that pepper is outside, you're inside. What is the shortest distance between you and that fresh pepper for dinner? And Crystal, what about yourself? What's your uh, thoughts on your? Well, I suppose you've had a lot of kitchen gardens, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, uh, we we have moved around just a little bit, uh, being that we were a military family. So, kitchen garden has gone from patios to growing boxes to just intercropping around plants that are already there. See where you can grow something. But yeah, basically, just keeping it as close to the kitchen as possible. Um, Sometimes, depending on where we are, that hasn't been entirely possible, but just keeping it close to the main access routes is is like the key, like how you come in and out of the house. At one point, I had an old table that was inside of a garage space that I had used like old buckets and things to like elevate up and then put lights that I had found on these buckets and it was trying to grow tomatoes and things under them. And tomatoes was not a great idea because they couldn't fruit as well because of the lights, but we did get salads and things growing, but that was like the best I could do in that particular situation. Um, But here where we are now, it's really nice because we actually have a big space to be able to grow things, but it isn't my space. So I'm, you know, a tenant and just planting things in and around different spaces where there's a gap. So it's not like interfering too much with the overall aesthetic that's already been designed here. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a bit different depending on how you are. Like you said, Cormac, your whole garden is a kitchen garden. <laughs> just depends on your size and what you, what you have available to you, I suppose. Hey. Yeah. <clears throat> um, right. So my, I, I don't have to, Anything beyond that, although I have, I suppose the front garden might be you could say is in our zone because I don't really access that as much. That's where the fruit is. Um, but I had a kitchen garden and having done many kitchen gardens, Crystal, would you uh, how would you recommend a beginner we get started building a kitchen garden? Oh, it's like what Bill Mollison says, I guess, start where you are. <laughs> um, 
like I said, I just started one of them right there in the garage just with like what I had, which was buckets and an old table and some old lights. Um, you can start seedlings like that and then, you know, move them into some pots or a windowsill or where, what. it just depends on your climate and what you have access to. So just get creative um, and start with things that are easy because otherwise you end up a little bit disappointed if it doesn't work out. Like the tomatoes, I thought, I grow tomatoes under these lights, but they need so much more for that fruiting, so much more of that energy and and that soil life and everything else than what I was offering in that particular space. But something like Swiss chard, which is just so easy to grow, probably, you know, should have been something that I had tried first. So just starting with plants that are easy and leafy greens probably, um, and just yeah. in whatever space that you're at. Yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, you have to, every garden, every kitchen is different. I mean, unless you live in an apartment building, but, you know, that's a different situation. But basically every kitchen, every back door, every kitchen door is is different. Um, so there is no correct protege. There is no correct kitchen garden. Um but there's some trends like greens. Absolutely. Like Crystal said, I think greens are, are pretty much everyone. You need them. You need to have greens. Like we've just kind of discovered arugula and just for its texture, instead of oh, salad, so salad it gets soggy, <laughs> arugula, we, we, we make rice and beans. We make a, uh, we could talk about food in this episode, which is great. Um, <laughs> rice and beans. We made, um, you know, a regular rice and beans and spice it up. My wife is a very good cook. I'm very lucky. And um, I've been eating rice and beans forever back into my vegan days in college and everything. Um, but I've never discovered arugula that hangs out at the edges of the rice and bean pile. You put it right there at the edge and it's got this texture and green. It's great. It's very exciting. So it's inspired us to make a bed, a bed of greens in our greenhouse because we want to have greens all next winter. I've been saying it for five yeah. years, babe, I'm going to, babe, I'm going to do the greens this year, babe lettuce this year this is really the year i swear <laughs> this is it oh, here, excited I'm because of the arugula up. like our our rice and beans is now a super upgrade it's like a little mexican's a little indian and it's got arugula it's just just perfect mm. so that's sick kitchen yep. garden i would just say i'd say plant number one is work with what you had like crystal said you know with what you have but second is plant what you want plant what you your your wife or husband or your family wants to eat it's really all that matters, you know, so learn how to plant those things and sort of form your garden around what you're realistically going to eat. Um, you know, we all watch videos and you're inspired. You see people doing different things and there's nothing wrong with trying different things. But you should really structure it around what you're actually would eat during the week and use and then get the fancy stuff and build out from there. Yep, I had uh, now on the edge of the kitchen garden, I had chickens. So it's like the permaculture thing that the the sort of weeds feed the chickens. You can just lob it to the chickens. Yeah. And then the chickens can get under the kitchen garden in small sections and till it and eat it. And the, the best bit, and it's something I put on all my designs, is you leave the back door, you go get your eggs from the chicken coop, and you walk past your greens, and you pick your greens, and you go in, you have a wee omelet. <laughs> yeah. In that loop. And I, that's... That's why I think animals in the kitchen garden is very important as well. Yeah, I mean, the compost is likely going to be your your kitchen scraps from from dinner after dinner. You know, there's always these loops, energy loops connecting on a homestead. And that dinner comes out and now now you have your plate, you scrape your plate, probably goes to the chickens anyway right there. So it's just like looping right back into the kitchen garden, looping into the kitchen. If you connect all those loops on your um, or any of those loops on your farm uh, homestead, and just really becomes a beautiful system after a while. And uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think like that, that reserving your own energy, like thinking about how how you can save that energy that you know, rather than work walking to the furthest possible thing and wasting time and energy, you just go to that closest possible thing. And then you've got more time and more energy for other things as well. So you're kind of living a more thoughtful existence, I suppose, about your own uh, time and space and as well yeah what, what yeah. are your uh, three favorite uh what are the three favorite uh your three favorite plants in your protege cormac 
Oh, be some well, uh, lettuce greens would be first. Mm -hmm. Um, chives, mm. chives and oh garlic my gosh, chives. Yes, perennial <laughs> and delicious. I I love garlic chives, and oh yeah, I had never tasted them. Or you don't get them in the shop until they're grown. And then the other one I would put on is uh, probably spring onions. Um, and what I do with the spring onions is I don't really grow them from seed. But if I'm out of the shop, I'll lift a packet of spring onions, use one and plant the rest out the back. And then that guarantees you a continuous supply of spring onions. So you just go out and chop a few. That's just they keep growing. So organic spring onions, instead of doing them from seed, which is hard, just buy one. If you're in the shop, like they're 50 pence for a bunch. Just plant them in your kitchen garden. And so you have all these spring onions all over the place and you just chop what you need and that's it, your gran and half a dozen really? bunches keeps you going. Okay. So you're kind of planning, I think they're biennial, right? So I just, the second I, year, but you're, you're treating them like an annual. You're just taking that first crop and, and using that. I, I don't seed it. I buy them in the shop and put them in the garden and amongst the lettuce, just sort of move the lettuce about, plunk them on and that's it. It'll keep them fresh. So they'll keep longer in the fridge. Oh, and you then, have an outdoor refrigerator. I see. Yeah. Uh, well, it's not even. A, you just put them in the ground, and <laughs> and it keeps think... them, it keeps them alive, and it's really handy because if you only need to use them once a week, in the fridge they go off, they go slimy. Whereas you put them out the back, they keep growing, and then you just cut and come again, and then they grow back, and then that'll do you throughout the growing season. They're really a uh, strong smell to insects and things as well. So it can help to sort of deter certain insects from those lettuces. So there's some some stacking going on there with using the function of that as, you know, like that's your edible, but it's also like used to maybe protect your other edibles from some of those pests that you might see come into the garden. Yeah, that is something really nice about, um, you know, like I grew up – I. The classic American backyard garden, rows of veggies, all very nice and 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 pretty, but no real thought about what's going on with the plants. You, you know what the, the flavor is like, you know what you like, and, you know, they come out nice. But what are those plants really doing? Like Crystal was saying, she revealed a layer of another thing in permaculture where we think about even even in a veggie garden, um, you know, like a potager is, is largely a veggie garden, can also have perennials like garlic chives, um, you know, and whatever. Um but um, the uh, it's there's these other things going on where insects are being attracted over here. Other plants, like Crystal mentioned, are being are repelling insects. The garlic chives and, and stuff like that repels rabbits as well, uh, maybe even deer. Um, so there's no, all no these deer other... right back here. <laughs> <laughs> there, uh, there. It's funny. Like we, I was in Pennsylvania and we had deer in our backyard, like rats, almost like. There were 10 one night. I could count 10 right in the backyard. And they just looked at me like, all right, we'll leave. They didn't even <laughs> care. Here here in Vermont, now I'm in the rural area. I was in a, more of a, a suburban city area there. Yeah, I, I don't see deer anymore. And I figured out why. They, they hunt up here. They, they, there's no deer up here because they they hunt them. They're, they're in their freezers. So um, that's one way to repel deer is move to Vermont. Well, I, I did hear the one that somebody so, somebody was complaining about the deer kept coming and eating their veggies, and somebody advised them, "Well, you don't have a vegetable garden; you've got a deer garden. Just shut the deer." <laughs> and there you that. go. <laughs> yeah, I grew a uh, I grew corn yeah. for a raccoon one year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. He was very appreciative. <laughs> we have kangaroos where we are here, and they work just the same, really, like the deer that we had, you know, in Colorado or California. It's just that's yeah, they they're just kind of the same thing, and they'll just look at you. But a deer, like what? Well, yeah, all they they seem to be a little more uh, skittish compared to a kangaroo. That's just gonna like kind of no yeah, well, back off, lady. Um, like yeah, you, yeah. you can have it for for now. All yours, friend. <laughs> well, deer yeah. deer don't know how to box, so yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> Yeah. Um, I thought that was a really good question. And I wanted to just chime on that as well. Like some, one of the things that I've personally loved, like you said, the three things, but I don't think I necessarily have three particular things that I love to grow, but what I've discovered in growing in small spaces 
has been I want to grow things that are highly productive on a small scale. So, yes, I love tomatoes, but a big tomato plant is taking up all this extra space. But going vertical with a vining cherry tomato, I'm getting a high yield of cherry tomatoes. So we're still getting like a nutrient content and things, and we're getting we're getting a higher yield out of that space than I would if I had it stuck like a regular tomato bush getting my big steak tomatoes. Um, and same with like pepper plants. If I want to try and grow capsicums, I actually, they're a larger fruit. I have more difficulty in those small spaces growing the plants with the larger fruit. I tend to go with the smaller plants more, which makes sense because you're working in a smaller space, but the higher productivity. Peppers is something I've probably grown in every single garden I've lived in um, because they are so easy to grow. And you can grow them in a small space. You can grow them in a window. You can grow them in so many different places. I found it really easy to grow those. And you can get spicy ones or you can get like the Anaheim ones that aren't really very spicy. Um, And you can collect so many seeds from those. So you're seed saving every single year just off of one of your peppers that you can then grow again the next year and the next year. Um, And you can also get the spicy ones, of course, if you like spicy food. But I like to grow those anyways, even though they're like way more than I'm going to eat um, because I grind them up. They dry them out and grind them up and use them as a pest spray on the other plants. So oh. I'm growing basically my own pest control in that space as well because you will get some things, especially if you're growing in a smaller space. Like we did a patio. Everything was on concrete. So we had to grow everything in bags, in fabric bags. And you don't okay. get that same kind of soil situation we had a worm farm and everything so we could continue creating a healthy soil life but it's a little bit different sometimes and so you can get a little more stress on your plants in those container gardens a little bit sometimes but um yeah growing your own stuff like that in those small spaces is kind of important as well so we were able to help the plants to be a little bit more resilient just by growing an extra spicy pepper plant (laughs) if that makes sense (laughs) yeah yeah, um, I was. You made me. You, you made me think. You were saying about tomatoes. Um, I was just working on a permaculture design recently, and you know, I was just thinking about that. How the tomato takes up just three feet when you're looking on the paper in a design, it takes up three feet. And you're like, oh no. Then I was reading uh, one of these many permaculture books. Actually, this excellent book. Uh, no, that's not it. Here it is. Called uh, Plant Partners. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's cool. There we go, plant partners. So it's really kind of in depth about the latest science on companion planting, and it'll just take little bites of things. So one of the things discovered, I'm sure you heard, was that uh, basil plants really well with tomatoes. And if you're Italian, you just, you just know that instinctually. Um, <laughs> but what I didn't like, I didn't understand the science behind it. So uh, so I thought of the tomato. You know, in permaculture, we do uh, food forests, and you have, so you have a canopy tree and a shaded area underneath. So instead of saying, oh, my three feet's taken up by that tomato, I'm interplanting basil, three basils around each tomato. So I'm using that understory. You were saying about being efficient efficient and using space. Plus you wanna do that. You wanna bring in the insectary value of the, the basil to help the tomatoes. Also in your potage, uh, you know, here in, in North America, where um, the Three Sisters, classic Three Sisters Guild comes from, that's also a sort of stacking of the same space. You have your corn stalk as your as your trellis, and your beans then then are using the same space as that um, corn stalk, and then the the squash below are taking up that ground space in between. So it's a stacking of space, uh, but you have to be smart about what you're putting together because most plants get along, but some plants really get along well, and they they improve the flavor and yield of the other plants. So it's worth taking that time, but it's, it's not rocket science. And once you kind of have your, your guild down, you know, that basil goes with tomatoes and, you know, uh, like you were talking about peppers, like hot pepper plants. They also are very good. They have a great insectary value. Even if you don't eat the peppers, they're ornamental. They're beautiful. They bring in good insectary value. Plus you might have friends come over oh, yeah. and eat hot peppers. It's nice to have one in the potage just in case you have company. If you, you know, so yeah, I I actually love actually harvesting some of those peppers and and handing them and giving them to friends. So that you just get so many of them, 
Yeah, and and people beautiful. will make a comment of it. Yeah, they do. They look really nice. And you're like, oh, mm. well, you know, you just make sure you wear gloves when you like harvest them because that that oil sometimes, depending on the pepper, you don't want to be going and rubbing your eyes after you touch those because yeah. I've done that. that. That's definitely a thing. Because I, I, I think we talked about this on a different podcast, Cormac, where you love to just get your hands into the soil and you just love touching the you know everything there it's sort of part of that experience but yeah there are certainly some plants that maybe just be a little more careful especially with those peppers yeah that's like (laughs) the carolina reaper you you won't give that out for halloween you know (laughs) that's no maybe Uh, maybe a jalapeno but go to your neighborhood (laughs) well it's a it's a good uh uh if somebody you don't like comes around here, try this. That's true. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Pest repeller. Yeah, pest repeller. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, Mike, what about your uh, top three? Did you... so I'm going to have to say arugula. It blew my mind the other night. Um, so there's one. And it's easy to grow. It's, it's hearty and it's tasty and it's Italian. So... Then I'd have to I'd have to say hot peppers. I make a hot pepper sauce almost. I actually don't have to make it every year. It lasts for like two, three years in the fridge. I make a big batch, and um, but I'm also in zone fours, three, four. So I tried to grow habaneros on a hope and a prayer, and it didn't work out. But I can grow jalapenos, um, stuff like that. So pe- hot peppers, and then I'd say my third is probably. From the potage, probably tomatoes. I know it's typical, but uh, you know my favorite fruit is a pear. You know, so I wear blue jeans and a t-shirt. Big deal. <laughs> so, <laughs> see when you're growing peppers, uh, <laughs> you obviously the two where you have stayed have warm, warm, very warm summers. Whereas here, my my summer isn't very warm. I have right. I tried growing peppers a few times, but it was a half-assed attempt. It wasn't a so do you need them heaters to grow the grow the chilies? Yeah, yeah, they stay in the. I I can grow them. I when I have my greenhouse stabilized, I'll be able to because it just be a you know long time in there and then get them out for the season. Uh, it gets up to like ninety Fahrenheit here at at the hottest of the summer that I got. That's a really like a almost a record breaking hot day. Uh, but that's probably hot enough. It's it's timing. It's the the shoulder season. I've got to just you know it's got to be indoors. We're going to do a hoop house, like a fifty foot by twenty foot hoop house. Probably not next year. Probably the following year. And then we'll do peppers, tomatoes, all that inside of the, you know, a better microclimate. But uh, yeah, that's weird. You're in that weird climate, um, Cormac, where you have the you kind of have the heat, but you don't really have the sunlight. So plants that are imported all around the world today might not grow you know even if you get the opposite too you get the opposite where it's like it's too hot and you need shade houses and you actually need to protect uh protect the plants from that heat as well because they can be sensitive to having too much and that could be in desert climates or it could just be like the the tropics if it's in an exposed hot long long day of just extreme heat yeah, that's why you know sometimes a permaculture design is really important. If especially if you're investing some money in fruit trees and everything, is just to because it's not it's not just simply the zone the the hardiness zone that you're in, and you know based on what country you're in, but it's it's really it's all those other climactic factors that that it's really the climate zone you're in that's more complicated. And so you know in a permaculture design, we'll do a sector analysis, kind of measure those different things and assess and and analyze what's going on. And kind of come up with a, a plant list that's not going to get dinged on the edges by those, you know, complicating factors. Um, but again, I, I have to say it again, the plants didn't read the book. So you really <laughs> don't know until you plant it in your personal potage. And I think it was a crystal or Cormac that mentioned about saving seeds. If you start saving your seeds of your favorite plants, not every single plant in the world, overwhelming task that you'll never do. Just start with your favorite <laughs> top three or your top 10. And um, then those pl- in your protege, which is probably a very important garden. If you cook every day, if you're gardening, you probably cook. So um, it, yeah, just, you know, concentrating those there um, is, is the best thing. 
Yeah, and saving those seeds also helps to make those plants resilient to your your like every year that that plant like has a memory in that seed. So as the climate is changing or you have these extremes, whether it's cold or hot or whatever, those seeds choosing this might be a segue into the next section, but choosing the correct variety of seed for your climate. So like you can't just get any old tomato, like I was saying before, I it, it, not just space wise. But growing a big tomato versus the cherry tomatoes, like that could be the difference in your yield, really. If you're in a colder climate where you've got, like where we were in Colorado, having a very, very short season, we've got like two months basically, try and grow something. I'm not going to get that great big tomato or the great big watermelon. I'm going to have to choose smaller varieties, smaller um, smaller watermelons, smaller things, because there's just so much, like less time for the for of energy to to grow that kind of fruiting plant and you know i don't want to live on just leafy greens i want to actually add variety to my diet that is part you know is the fruiting varieties but yeah yeah saving those seeds helps to make it resilient to those to those weather to that climate every year because oftentimes we'll get seeds or things from things at the grocery store you know we cut up our own veggies and we'll save seeds from that or We'll go and purchase seeds from a supplier, either locally or we'll just order them online. There's all different ways to get the seeds. And yes, they'll grow. But every year that you're saving those seeds, you create that memory and its genetics that makes it resilient to where you are in your microclimate. So that might seem really complicated. So just to keep it simple, it's just keep saving the seeds from what you're growing so that each year that plant's more resilient to the pest or it's more resilient to the cold or the heat, basically. three, Three years from what I understand to 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 land race uh the first year you kind of just plant and see what grows you got to see who's yep. you know even if you're uh you know so i mean even if you're taking some risks it's okay it's a packet mm-hmm. of seeds it's not a million dollars um and and observe and watch second year you'll kind of you'll have picked some seeds and so these guys should do better but you're still in a sort of i'm not worried about production i'm sort of still observing and and getting a second layer and then by the third year, you should have your you should have your land race seeds that have adjusted to not only like where you live, but where they're planted on your your land. It might be near a building, there might be a shadow, it might be shady, there might be wind there for some reason, there might be something in the soil you don't know. And a permacon permaculture designer can only do so much. When you start land racing, you're actually allowing the seeds to become little permaculture designers, and and they're they're right on mm. the ones that die. They're actually doing a service. For the ones that live on, you know, because they give up their space. They also tell you, hey, that I was the wrong seed for this garden. So yeah, that's it's, right. it's amazing. There's this collect like a brain, a brain, a brain cell by itself is stupid. It really is. It's just <laughs> this little wet thing that just doesn't isn't impressive at all. <laughs> but when you have billions of them together, suddenly you've got something, you know, you've got for better or for worse, you got things that humans do. So the same thing happens with seeds and time. And, you know, you're, we're learning about crowdsourcing and we're learning about all these other things, the microbiome, the, the bacteria and that. They send little chemical signals. And when there's billions of them, suddenly you got an election. And then they're voting on your mood and what you're craving and all that. And they're just dumb, individual, dumb little things. And you can say the same thing with a seed, although a seed's really not dumb because it has this ancient genetic code in it. But... Honestly, if you were to just put it on the table and wait for it to entertain you, nothing would happen. But when you put all those seeds together in mass numbers, it suddenly becomes this intelligent. And then you have layers of time, like hybrid hybridizing seeds. We talked about that in the land racing thing, but obviously it's something that fascinates me. But it, there's this collect, there's this intelligence that forms when you talk about numbers. And when this, the plant's putting out all these seeds, you're picking the best out of those numbers year after year. It's exponential. And it becomes this intelligence of its own. So, yeah, that's it's it's fascinating. But if we take it back to the basics, so for a, a very beginner who buys a seed packet, and I don't know what you do, but I sit down at the start of the year and, and get the seed packet and say when it starts, where it finishes, fill out a spreadsheet, and then completely ignore it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then I just go whenever I get a. A time at the weekend, I'll just shuffle through the seeds. Oh, I can plant this now. I can plant this now. So that was a, the second section is about planning and about how uh, sort of like seeds, seed packets and calendars. 
So, Crystal, do you read the packet? <laughs> and then uh, do you ignore it? Yeah, I do. I, I actually, I hadn't been reading the packet mm. anymore because I had been saving my own seeds. I knew which plants I wanted to grow. It, But then when I've moved, you know, I've been like, oh, okay, hang on. My varieties now change. Like I was saying, when I went from California to Colorado, I could – take my seeds with me but they just didn't do as well they just weren't from that they weren't the right varieties for the for the short season so my you know I could plant 10 seeds in California maybe 10 seeds would grow but those 10 seeds in Colorado maybe not 10 seeds would grow maybe they would grow but they would be stunted like it just wasn't the right climate for them so I had to start actually looking at seed packets and finding the correct variety like researching sort of what variety was the most suitable of the tomatoes for my climate and yellow cherry tomatoes were the most suitable. Hey, nice. Good yeah. Good. Ornamental as well. And what about you, Mike? Do you, are you a man that, uh, I suppose, what's your on, view on the seed packets and do you read them? Make a yeah, plan? I, have no, I have no shame about looking at the seed packets. I don't have all that memorized. Um, I don't. I you know, that's, you're talking about planning. And if you're planning, let's say we're talking about an annual garden. If you're planning a, a this is really probably more about annuals and, and seeds and seed packets. Um, the biggest thing is, is the number it's knowing where you are. It's knowing this, you, you, this is, and correct me if I'm wrong, planning the first thing you should plan when you're planning out your, your veggie garden, your annual garden, whether or not you're mixing perennials in it or not. There's, there's grow days for that the seed has each seed, each plant takes a certain amount of radishes are really quick you know other things are really long that they, they take a long time and so it, it gets a little complicated there's also like there's how many grow days that you have where you live it's from frost to frost so this is for beginners so you're, you're really nailing everything down on the spring frost date and if you're doing later plantings there's even a fall frost date where you want to kind of anchor your plantings to that. So, um, you know, there's so probably the, for planting your seeds is, but you got to figure out which, the, the ones with the longer, how many grow days you have where you're at. And then that means you can't plant things, you know, things, if you only have 90 grow days and something takes 120, it's going to die before it, it fruits. So you have to plan not only what has to go indoors, you know, so you plant your seeds indoors and they grow by the window or in a greenhouse or something. But, um, you know, what grows indoors, but what, also what you can plant outside. So I'd say the number one thing is is knowing what grow days you, you know, like with perennials, you worry about the grow zone and everything. It's going to be hardy. With vegetables, you worry about grow days. Um, so knowing the grow days that you are and then knowing each of the plants that you're going to plant, how many grow days they are, and then having a strategy to start them early. And so that they get big enough that you can let your kids play outside and transplant them in the garden. Yeah. And you can just Google that too, right? Like what are the grow days for my region? What is the earliest frost or the latest frost or whatever for my, and then just, just Google that what with your town name or your, whatever your location looks like and yeah, just and get that information. Yeah. Or you could even compile a list for you because that list is going to be specific to you if you do a spreadsheet or, or you like to write things on paper and with a magnet on the fridge. Yeah. That's where that journaling, that journaling comes in handy. There is being able to write all that down and record that information. That's what I was doing. I would take my seed packet and I would journal. You just, I guess this is, can I tie this in now? Oh, sure. <laughs> we're, we're, yeah, the, we're bringing it back. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I take the seed packets, you know, like I, so I've just moved back to Australia and I couldn't take any seeds with me because that's illegal. So I've given all of my seeds to anyone I know who likes to plant anything. So friends who like to grow flowers and not food, I gave them my flower seeds. You know, I it really handed out what I could to whoever I could. I knew would grow it because they like to grow it. Um, and neighbors who were interested, just try it. You know, here's some seeds, just try it and encourage that, but I couldn't bring them with me. So I've really gone back to reading seed packets again. What, you know, am I dealing with here in this particular climate? It's been 15 years since I've here, I've been here and, you know, it, it feels hotter than I remember, but I did just come from negative, you know, 20 into <laughs> 40 degrees <laughs> right. Celsius, you yeah. know, so 
But um, yeah, reading those packets and then I would take the information off the packet and write it into my journal. So it's like the date I've purchased the seeds. That way, you know, in a few years from now, if I'm like, oh, that seed fell behind the, the bookcase or whatever, wherever I'm storing it, I can say, what is that seed packet? I actually have looked back in my journal and have been like, oh, this was the supplier. This was when I bought it. What is the viability of those seeds now? That's getting a little more complex because, you know, the older the seed gets, the less viable it is, like the less chance it'll grow. Um, so keeping a record of when I've bought those seeds is really helpful and then how those seeds have done as well. So there are times where I've bought seeds and I'm like, the, none of the seeds that I've bought from this company are any good. So they're, hmm. they're not expired but per the packet, um, but they just didn't have a very good germination rate. You know, like I've planted 10 of them and four of them grew. So what happened to the others? So now I've wasted time, especially in a short season climate. That's huge. If I've only yeah. got 60 to, to, to 90 days maybe to grow something and only a few of those seedlings have actually worked, now I've got to spend more money to plant even more, which is taking up even more space to try and keep that viability. So recording what that looked like in my journal so that when I went back again to purchase more seeds perhaps, I would be able to you know, no, this supplier has not been good. I'm going to switch to this other one that has been good. And now I'm you're like, does that make sense? You know, I'm, I'm saving time and energy and money for myself and space too. So journaling can become really important and it can be really fun too. So like, that's just like your data collection on your seed packets, but you can go further into that as well, like drawing pictures or, or or sketching out whatever the pest is that you've been experiencing. And it, actually the book becomes something quite beautiful to look at when you've been doing it over a number of years. Yeah, I've seen your journal. It is beautiful. <laughs> I should have had it here for the podcast. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we can just upload some pictures at a later date. <laughs> yeah. Do you, do you journal, Mike, yourself? Um. Not, I mean, I never really had a diary or anything. I I pretty much do everything on paper. And I've just kind of <laughs> fallen into a pattern of uh, just uh, like <laughs> doodling. So when I tear out the pages, I used to use the marble notebooks. I've got like a hundred of them up in the attic. So I used to journal in a way, not, not the... In, permaculture observations and in, in the garden my wife has excuse me i'm sorry uh jen jen has she's done more journal she has a garden journal and little drawings and stuff it's pretty um but i, I haven't done a lot of journaling myself i do spreadsheets so that's more my style I, I will record important things um on the spreadsheet um i want to say just one more thing um about planning it's not just you're, you're not just planning you know the um the timing of, um, you know, the plants and how they'll live, et cetera, and when they'll produce where you're at. You're also planning in, and just before we get into the journaling uh, fully, you're also plan planning in time. And, and, you know, like Crystal was saying about being efficient with your space, especially if it's a small potager garden or if you're doing container gardening or whatever, um, there is, you know, some crops are short like radishes they might come in and they might have a purpose and they do that and you harvest them now you have this big long season ahead of you with the empty space so you also want to think about what, what else could go into that space you want to plan what else could go into that space afterward some like tomatoes or whatever they're going to be there the whole season so that's their they have season season tickets okay but <laughs> other other people who are you know other plants are just there for a, a short time and then they have an empty seat for the rest of the season so there's also that planting a, a like a second crop a fall crop so a lot of times you could do a spring crop and then a fall crop in the same spot and then sometimes you're thinking you're planning for spring ahead so you put like a cover crop in in the fall with the intention of it being turned over in the spring so it, it grows and it, it brings material so there's there's a lot of different layers of um of planning and there is a lot of there are a lot of good uh, resources out there to help you with your garden. If you've ever seen a garden planner, it's got a lot of that going on, you know, in time. So, so it does take, take a little bit of effort. That's why it's good to start with as few plants as possible, your favorite plants first, and just get a feel for that, 
you know, for new gardeners, get a feel for that rhythm, you know, in the season. And then you, then you can, then your yeah. confidence will grow and then you'll start expanding. And also you use the example of radish and I kind of want to just touch on that because that's a basic, that is actually a really good one to grow for beginner gardeners. And I think this is relevant too for the cooler climates more specifically, but they are a really short season plant to grow and they're so easy to grow and they're so versatile to use in the kitchen, whether you're grating them up raw in a salad or you're, you're putting them in a stew or whatever that might be. Um, they grow really easily so and they don't take much time. So once they, you've put that in there and you've harvested those up, you're saying you can then chuck something else in the ground, whether it's lettuce or whatever. You want to follow mm -hmm. it with something else. Yeah, exactly. And then, something like some things that like I know corn is likes a lot of nitrogen. So you would follow it up with like a nitrogen fixer to fix what the corn did, the crop that's nitrogen fixing, and sort of repair the soil. And then you're ready for next year for the corn again. And then the cycle repeats. So there's there's these different layers that, you know, and the information's out there. Um, you know, that if you stack all those things, you can have really in a few years, you could just have like a garden that just really makes you happy and produces a lot of food in as in a small a space as possible. How many years did you say again? Three years from from your observation from the start to really starting to understand what that space, your time, like that planning and time will come with that too, right? Like by your third yes. year, you're going to start to understand, okay, radishes come up really quickly, but this didn't mm -hmm. come up as quickly or this didn't do as well. And radishes came up in the, in the spring and now we've got this really hot sun in the summer, like replacing it with a, you said three years? Uh, yeah, three, I would say three, uh, three years I've heard for, for land racing, but it's basically the process of observation. So yeah. and that sounds reasonable for three years to, you know, if you have three years where you're paying attention to your garden, I would say it's, it's humming. It's humming. Pretty yeah, well. I'd agree with you're, that. Whether too. you're land racing or not, and you might have a, a local seeds, but remember those seeds are, you know, there's a lot of great seed companies in the United States and around the world. But, you know, you could if you find like as far as if you if you want to land race and you really want to make your garden personal and maximize its its health and potential, then you want to probably find as old of a of a heirloom seed as you can as close geographically to where you are. And then you're yeah. starting you're starting that seed close to the target as close as you can. Yeah. And that seed just needs to move a few years and get get into perfection you know, and, and land racing. Something but I've done will, too, because, oh, sorry, it just cut no, out a little it, bit. It'll but... land race forever. It's not just, it doesn't stop after three years. It just keeps improving. But in three years, you should be able to recognize the garden is, is, is obeying you. I hate to say it. That yeah. Way, you know? Yeah, no, I, I, I would agree with that. Just be, having moved every few years, basically with military lifestyle, that's probably about right. Because some of the frustration I had with that was just now I'm getting to understand my space. And now I'm going to move again. Um, and in that understanding, like I'm still making food for my family. I've still harvested potatoes. I've still got all these flowers that we've dried and we've, we've made our own teas and things like that. Like, you know, we're still getting a yield as we're learning, but the space becomes refined and you start to learn what do I want to eat? What am I going to grow? What seeds are the right seeds? And something that might save some people some time if, you, you, if you're comfortable with this is I've definitely just asked people. I've moved somewhere new. I've made a couple of new friends and I've said, hey, I noticed you like gardening. Do you have any seeds I might be able to have to start my garden? And it's local. So just even yeah. asking friends or going to the local farmer's market and buying foods that you eat and saving seeds from, from those local foods as well, just for your own personal garden. You're not there to, to take those seeds and then grow them and compete with the farmer or something either. You know, like that's a little bit of a different story. Yeah, but taking that seed, like you said, yeah, a collaborative effort to, to go ahead and just like find that local resilient uh, seed. And somewhere that people can start to find those things is, you know, you can find those things in the grocery store or a farmer's market, but a lot of places do have community gardens. Most places I've been and live, there's been a community garden, even high altitude um, alpine desert living, I have had community gardens. Yeah. So it just, 
they're there and that's a great place to be able to go because generally people who get into this are more than happy to do a seed yeah. swap or share or be like, yeah, sure, take some. I've got an abundance of something. Just have some. It's yeah, about that a, sharing and the, networking the guy, and community. The guy that started Monsanto, I think I heard, um, he was in a, he had a community garden and everyone was swapping seeds and he's like, no, nah, you got to pay me for mine. <laughs> and that's how it started. That's how it started. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I don't I heard that on the internet. I don't I don't know if it's true. Must be true. Well, if it's on the internet, uh, of course it's true. Oh um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I have an experience of both of them where I've been chatting in a uh like an experienced local gardener and he says, Here, uh don't waste your time with the other tomatoes. Like it was a he says, Try try this tomato. He gave me a he gave me a seed on it was like a Russian tomato or some Russian variety. So that does really well here. And he also gave me comfrey and uh which was he had he had you no know, dove it up for years. I think he, he'd been doing it for twelve years. He'd been wow. um uh, probably getting his comfrey. I think it was twelve. Um and as well then as there's plenty of seed swaps. And if there isn't a seed swap in your area, go buy ten packets of seeds and advertise a seed swap. <laughs> Yeah, because you'll meet like-minded people. You get to know people. You get to know where they're gardening, and people like to come together and swap seeds. You know, the city yeah. library in most places I've lived has had a seed uh, catalog. Oh yeah. So I don't know if you go to your library. I have four kids, so I go to the library. You know, this is a great activity to do with kids. They love to read. They love books, and if you just sort of poke around in those places you definitely start to find those things. And I found in the, the pretty much everywhere I've lived, there's been a seed catalog of some kind, whether so that's does, a swap system or something. Yeah. So how does that work in the library? Is it a seed catalog, seed library? The, you just, everybody brings excess seeds and you can go on and have, yep. have some. Yep, exactly. Uh, the last one that I was at was, it, it was people like they've planted their seeds for the season or their military rights. So they're moving or, it, you know, because these these military areas, people are there's a high turnover rate, and so um, mm. and they're moving overseas. You can't take seeds overseas, seeds overseas. Um, so there's off. It's like a drop off point. You can take them and share them, and other people can then benefit from it. So there was times I thought, okay, well, um, I didn't really like eating this, so I can take my seeds and leave them there, and somebody else might pick those seeds up and grow it, and they do enjoy eating it, or maybe they'll use it for a school project, and the whole class gets to learn something new too. Like that, you don't know what that's going to be used for, um, but I guess I'll go into it with optimism. Um, but yeah, it, it's it's like a I guess it's like a an informal seed swap, but it's hosted by the library, and it's you know. The the last one was organized where they did have like, you know, it, they tried to keep tomatoes with tomatoes and beans with beans. But there's been other ones where it's just like a, a box of seeds and you kind of just sift through and like, oh, that one looks okay. So it's so, class. And that's where you start reading <laughs> your seed packets again because you're like, but does this uh. work in my region? So then you have to like go back to that frost dates thing and the length of the season and is, you know, it, that's important too. So you start reading the seed packets again. So, yeah. You're talking about moving. I was thinking like, yeah, you, you've had to move. And I've moved, I think like 11 times. I think the average American moves 11 times in their life. Um, so I don't know if wow. it's any, you guys are, you're also in former British colonies. I don't know if you guys move as much <laughs> as current, I do. Current, current British colony. <laughs> Gary, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's right. You're still occupied. Sorry. Um <laughs> But um, uh, it's not a, not exactly a well, it's a colony, I guess. But uh, uh, anyway, so but here's the thing, and this is for new gardeners. Don't be don't be discouraged. I mean, with the land rate, we're talking about land racing. Land racing picks up quickly. Seeds because you're planting them each year. They, they learn. They they pick it picks it up quickly. Um, you you may not be able to keep carry your fruit trees with you when you move if you plant fruit trees. Um, you might not be able to take your seeds across international boundaries, or certainly not to Hawaii. They don't let you take anything there. Um. <laughs> But you do, you take your knowledge each year and your knowledge only grows. So you go, yeah. even though it's a different climate and a different piece of land, you're, you're, you're learning principles that will apply anywhere. Um, and you might have to learn new things in a cold climate or a hot climate all of a sudden or whatever. But um, 
you know, these these the permaculture principles that you're learning. And the first one is the most important and it, and it really is. And it does segue really nice into the journaling. If we would just want to say a few more things about that is observe and interact. And your observe when you observe and you actually then go and take the effort to write it down um, in, in a journal or, or however, even if you're entering it on your phone, however you journal, if you, you're again, you're again, putting your brain through that, that process again, and that observation is going to be even, it's going to solidify in your mind more because you're at, you're not just, oh yeah, you're, oh yeah. And writing it down and then maybe even reading it. Yeah, later. yeah. It'll just, it, if you want to accelerate, you know, you, they, there's an expression about, you know, you're not just growing plants in a garden, you're growing the farmer. If you want to accelerate your own growing and your own knowledge, which is only going to improve your gardens each year, then journaling might a simple simple journal might be just the way to go and and then to actually reread that journal on occasion um it'll remind you of things oh yeah definitely uh i think they call it picture note noting or something like that where basically your note taking style is becomes just these pictures and so that's kind of something that i've done is you take mm -hmm. you see something you draw you draw it and it's like you said it just reinforces this in your memory and then there's times where I'm like, hang on a minute, I've seen this one before or I've done this before and I go back to my journal and I sort of flick through it and I'm like, there it is. And I've got some little notes there with those pictures or whatever, whether that's the experience, whether that was whatever I, I pulled out of a book or Google or something that I wrote about it. Um, and then I can go back and look at that. And as a designer, I have written very specific calculations about things like spillways I know that gets even more complex but then I go mm -hmm. back and I look at that so I started at the very beginning drawing a couple of bugs or where you know it, this this was eating these plants or this was the result from this bug or whatever that was and I started from those really smaller things and over the years that I've been doing it those pictures have changed a little bit but then I do forget some of those things too and I'll go back to that and then I, I go into the more advanced stuff too. And then I go, well, how do I do that calculation again? Hang on a minute. I, my brain's fried today. I need to go back into my journal and look at that and I'll find it. It's, it's just great. And I am a little, um, I'm organized in the way I do it as well. So I'll be like, this is where I have that kitchen garden stuff. And I'll have a little section there. That's like um, the urban kitchen garden where I've got like uh, different diagrams I've drawn with pallet gardening and the different plants that you can grow in those shallow sort of spaces to um, the more, you know, here's your raised bed garden. This is what I planted in this garden this year and it worked and I'll draw that and I'll, I will label these plants, what I planted with whatever. And, you know, maybe the next year my tastes have changed, but, Maybe I'm having a bad year and I need to refresh. I can go back to that and say these were the plants that worked together. Or maybe I want to move that to a different part of the garden and I'll remember that. Or I can take a picture of that and text it to a friend and say, try this. So that's something that's been very helpful for me as well. I've done that with clients as well. Here's a picture. You know, this is what I've, I've seen, what I've learned through just experience. I think that's good that you use it as a, like a feedback loop that when you're sort of losing your way. Slightly or you're struggling, you go right, go back to your journal and just get re inspired yeah. and go, Oh, that's from absolutely, and it brings you back on the street. Yeah, it, it really does. Yeah, just thinking about seeds in general. If you can zoom right back out here, um, <laughs> and like, because Bill, you're telling the stories about like community and like seed swapping and everything. And I, I, I know I, I'd read before the seeds were the original currency. Like seeds were used as money uh, because I mean, think about it, how valuable it is. You know, it's an obvious currency. It was like the first thing. So we have money today and, you know, different currencies in our country. But over that backyard fence with the community uh, in the community garden or whatever, you're talking about seeds just exchanging. You know, that's it's it's almost like this other currency, obviously, that like brings in energy. You were mentioning energy crystal um, and. Like, you know, there's that, and you've mentioned this before, Cormac, um, you know, the, the eight forms of capital, um, you know, so there's the, the, there's your spiritual capital and your social capital. I mean, I'm not going to mention all eight, but your seeds are sort of, they're like living capital. Um, so you, 
you then connect with other people with the seed. It's sort of like this, the transfer through yeah. that network of, you know, thing, but you're getting more than just plants. You're getting more than just stuff. You're getting social things. You're actually getting a spiritual moment, maybe, you know, like, which is important. Um, and you're growing your knowledge. So you're actually growing different for intellectual capital, spiritual capital, social capital, living capital, um, all, you know, in the seed and, and that exchange. And then you get to watch it grow and then you get to eat what it grows, you know, like it's. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's no surprise. It was the original currency. And if things don't work out on planet Earth here, it might be the new currency again. You know, who knows? But uh <laughs> Always keep your seeds. They're super powerful. That's like the most powerful thing in the world. Seeds. Oh, just um, the currency in Australia way back in the day was actually rum. Just want to put that one out there. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit different. Yeah, yeah, no, Gar no, just... Gardening and booze, a perfect combination. <laughs> it's fantastic. It's, yeah. like, it's a way to spend an afternoon, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, I know I definitely want to agree with you on that uh, because – there's been people I've given seeds to and they'll come back the, the next year and be like, and I'll say, Oh yeah, how'd that go? Or they will just bring it up and say, Oh yeah, thanks for those seeds, by the way, because you know, they've grown a garden and it just starts with, with a seed. Right. And now you've grown a garden. Now you've grown a friendship. Now you've got a, a point of conversation. Um, there's gardeners everywhere you go. There's always, you'll always find the gardeners, the the plant people, and have a great conversation and like you said growing that that experience and that uh that intelligence about that it, it that's pretty important yeah 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 so that's coming us coming up an hour uh we could chat an hour but <laughs> i think we have to call it a day uh so thanks very much that was uh our podcast on seeds journaling uh basically that's what it turned on the other way and our lunchtime yeah. episode so if you want to catch the lunchtime learning episode it's you'll find it at uh vinepermaculture.com forward slash ll5 and that's basically we're doing a lunchtime learning series where we're going to do 40 episodes over the course of the year um just on how do you get into garden for beginner gardeners just how do you look at your space how do you use your space it's not a be all and end all guide, but it's just introducing you to all the concepts that you'll need to think about. We're not going to spoon feed these. You just need to go away and think about these things and then look at your own property. If you'd like help with that, go over to our, we could do consultations. We'll do an hour consultation. And then if you feel that you want to design, tap into our expertise. We are the designers. We'll be doing the work for you. So you get on a call with us. We'll look at your property, we'll look at your resources, we'll look at your personality, what you like, what you don't like, and then we'll come up with a design together. So it's up to us to ask you the right questions and get the right design for you, and then we'll follow that up then. You can join our um, Growers Club at the end of the year where you can keep asking questions to get that feedback. And there's also other options there, two minutes to go over, but that's on our website, findpermaculture.com. Crystal, it was great having you on the show. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. <laughs> and Mike, likewise, it was great having you on as well. It was uh, nice doing it with, with the three of us. Uh, yep. Just something to uh, new gardeners. Just remember, like, you're a better gardener than you realize. It just takes a little time to 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 know that. So yeah. there's there's no such thing as a green thumb. You already have a green thumb. You just have to let yourself explore. Yep. And there's nothing wrong with failure. Yep. It's the best teacher. Yep. Guys, thanks very much for listening and thanks to everybody. See you next week. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. There's a place I have found in the shade on the ground Far from all worries and troubling sound When I go there to be by myself only me No what I came there to see